Good day, YouTubers. I hope uh, all is well. Um, or should I say good evening, depending on what part of the globe you are. Excuse me while I uh, take out this. Right. Yes, so, what is the subject of today? Well, the Lord has moved me to share with you an amazing book that uh, he led me to pick up. And it's actually to deal with those that I'm coming across in an increasing number, which is i.e. the evolutionists and the atheists. Um, for those who are wondering what's this t-shirt I'm wearing, it says Mad Flavor, and it's my interest in and uh, admiration for graffiti art. Um, not the actual defacing of buildings, but I think when you have bland, horrible, ugly looking brick walls, if it can be filled with colorful and ingenious, uh, what's the best way to say it, um, artistic representations, then uh, why not? You know, I think it should be decriminalized, and I think the uh, young, skilled graph artists should be encouraged and, and, well, make a living out of it. You know? Uh, so anyway, greetings to my brothers and sisters in Christ on YouTube. Um, interestingly, I see, well, not that I'm aware of, there hasn't been much uh, communication from, from you folk. Um, I hope that you're not uh, allowing the cares of the world to uh, dominate your life. Um, and see, our Heavenly Father wants us to be loving to each other and to care for each other. And by that... Um, example that we lead, those who don't know him see it and are, are either moved to want to learn more, basically. Anyway, I know I tend to waffle on these things, so I'll get down to business. So, as I say, the actual book I'm sharing with you is called True Science Agrees with the Bible by Malcolm Bowden. Highly recommended. Um, I'm going to be sharing two parts of this. Um, I'm slightly changing the chapter title of this one just to get across the point that it's making. So I should be calling it on this vlog a scientific survey of Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So I'll begin. In this examination, no attempt is made to discuss every verse as Henry Morris has done it in his excellent The Genesis Record, but we will be dealing mainly with the more scientific aspects. For some events, a possible natural explanation will be suggested which might be labelled unsupported speculation by some. There should be no objection to providing an explanation for a verse where no corroboration can be obtained, provided any such explanation is biblically sound and in accordance with good scientific principles and evidence. The main purpose is to show that Genesis can be explained in most of its own account in a perfectly natural way and that it is unwarranted to dismiss it in, as ancient Hebrew myth. We will deal only briefly with each main event referring the reader to the later separate sections where specific subjects are dealt with in greater detail. So, I urge you to, if you like what you hear here and you see the, the, the um, the, the reasoning and the well, I won't use that word logic because I, 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 it annoys me when people use that word logic because to me that's uh, man's reasoning and uh, we're not supposed to reason the things of God with our limited mindset but attempt to allow him to mould our mind to understand things from his perspective Before embarking on this huge subject, we should find we should first examine the reliability of the document from which we draw much of our faith. Non-Christians might be under the impression that these documents are few, unreliable, and differ between themselves. This is not the case. We will be showing in Appendix 7 the extreme care with which the Jews copied their documents, as old ones had to be replaced. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls showed how very little difference there was between these 2,000-year-old versions and the present day. Regarding the New Testament, there are claims of some 5,000 New Testament manuscripts, but many are only a small part of a book, 
There are about 2,000 manuscripts of the Gospels and less than 100 copies of the, old, of the whole of the New Testament in Greek. There are some 14,000 Old Testament manuscripts. In, compa in comparison with this large number of accurately copied documents, those of the Greek and Roman world are sparse. For example, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, sorry, Gallic Wars, that's obviously when he was fighting what is now France, was written about 50 BC. The oldest surviving copy was written around 850 AD, some 900 years later, and there are only 10 ancient copies existing. Similarly, the Roman Tacitus, sorry, Tacitus, Tacitus is there, Histori histories were written 100 AD but the oldest and only two copies existing dates from 800 AD 700 years later yet no one doubts that these are as the authors composed them thus the documents undergirding the Christian faith are far more accurate and numerous than any other recording historical events with this assurance we can examine what they have to say to us today with considerable confidence as far as the Greek New Testament manuscripts are concerned, there are slight differences between them and comparing them to arrive at what the original manuscripts said is known as lower criticism. Higher criticism deals with the meaning and interpretation of the contents of both the Old Testament and the New Testament and this has generated a number of heretical views. So, section 1-1, one one, Genesis chapter 1 to two and in verse 3 the creation of the universe day 1 verse 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in this majestic statement God's first act in what might be called his great drama of the universe is set out for us there is no apology or explanation of what he did and certainly no hint of him providing his existence Sorry, proving his existence. That there is a supreme and infinite God is abundantly clear to all human beings when they examine the design and workings of nature. At the final judgment, no man will be allowed to hide behind the theory of evolution and claim that he was misled by his peers. The evidence is too overwhelming for such a pitiful excuse to be proffered before an almighty God. In the beginning. This suggests that this was the moment when time, as we know it, was created. God is obviously outside time and he has no difficulty in seeing the end from the beginning. It is just like a filmmaker who can see the whole of a length of film but it has to be projected only one frame at a time in order for us to understand it. Therefore God has no difficulty in predicting exactly what will happen for he has foreordained every event. This does not of course take away any of our responsibility for our actions. This seeming contradiction between human free will and God's predestination will be found to be non-existent and they will be seen to be fully compatible when he provides the final picture of all world events. Saint and sinner alike will all agree that his plan was perfect from the beginning. Furthermore, he is perfect and therefore he has never made a mistake. From, that, from this it follows that this is the best of all possible worlds, even with its pain and suffering. When all is finally revealed, every person will be forced to agree that this was the best possible way in which he could have carried out his amazing plan. God created. Only God can create a universe out of nothing, ex nihilo. Scientists still do not understand the working of the atom, but they know that there is an immense power locked up in every one. Some have described the atom as knots of energy in space. The heavens and the earth. What is intended by the word heavens? Does this refer to the spiritual heavens or the starry universe, or both? I would suggest that it is speaking of the creation of matter from which the earth was formed and of the universe of stars and galaxies. Although the world is plural, although the word is plural, this is also used to describe the visible heavens that declare God's glory, quoting Psalm 19:1. That the spiritual heaven and the angels were created before the physical earth and universe is indicated by God's reply to Job when he asks, "Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth?" when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy quoting Job 38 verses 4 and 7 the angels appear to have been watching God's great act of creation they may have been created only moments before the creation of the physical universe but more likely in another form of time frame one of the main problems facing the Christian is that there is a tendency to assume that the life hereafter will be much as we appreciate experience today 
I do not think that we can assume that anything, time, if it could be called such, will probably exist in a completely different form. This would mean that not only would ex eternal life be different, but the ap appalling prospect of eternity in hell, of the unregenerate, may also be totally different. Irrespective of this, what all objectors have is an inadequate trust in the perfect justice of God, who will finally demonstrate this before an onlooking world that can only agree that he is indeed just and perfect in every single one of his acts and judgments. The earth was without form and void. This is just a description of the earth before God began to shape it and make it a fit habitation for man. The Genesis record, and indeed the whole of the Bible, makes it abundantly clear that the earth was created in six days, and only a matter of a few thousand years ago. Despite this, there have been many attempts to evade this interpretation, and we examine the main ones and the motivation behind them in section 2-3. And God said, Let there be light. The precise nature of light is still unknown to scientists. It appears to behave sometimes as a wave and at other times as a particle. Quantum theory attempts to provide an adequate explanation of this phenomena, but probably no final satisfactory theory will ever be reached. In the same way that ripples in a pool need water to transmit them across the surface, so light as a waveform needs a medium in which to travel. This substance is denoted as ether, and its relationship with light is a fundamental aspect of physics, but the theory of relativity denies that the ether exists. We examine the subject of relativity in Appendix 8. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Here we have a clear assertion that the day was a normal one of 24 hours. This is repeated for each of the seven days of creation, and in view of this, there should not be any doubt in the reader's mind that only 24 hours was involved. Even though he is unlikely to read me Hebrew, it is surely obvious that this was what the writer, Moses, intended to convey in his record of events. Despite this clear emphasis, there are many sincere Bible believers who nevertheless look for vast periods of time within the creation account. There have been attempts to say that the word day can cover far more than 24 hours, even a million years or more for each day. This distortion of the Hebrew is not acceptable even to liberal Hebrew scholars as well as we will see in section 2 1. Day 2 verses 6 to 8. God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. In their book, The Genesis Flood, Whitcomb and Morris supported the view that this verse could be interpreted as the separation of a large amount of water that was placed in suspension at a high altitude called the water vapor canopy. This would have resulted in a number of beneficial effects during the pre-flood period, explain the longevity of the patriarchs and many other aspects. It can also explain several of the changes that were brought about following the flood. It obviously does not exist today, but there are one or two indications that there may have been such a canopy at one time. There are some technical problems with this proposal, however, and the whole subject is examined in section 3.1. Day 3, verses 9-10. to 10. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And God saw that it was good. The land now appears above the water. It should be noted that it is the water that is gathered into one place. This suggests that the area covered by the water is much less than that covered by the land, as otherwise it would have been land surrounded by a large area of sea. This is important as most experts assume that the original land area was about the same as we have today, whether the continents have moved or not. This may have a bearing on the resulting geological theories produced by creationists. For example, in calculating the land area to determine the amount of vegetation that may have existed at the time of the flood, the present areas are generally used. However, the actual area may have been very much greater before the flood, if the implication of this verse is considered. It does continue in verse 10 to call the water seas, in the plural. It is possible that they were one connected body of water, but were positioned in large separate areas, not unlike the Great Lakes of Canada. It does seem clear that the earth was one whole area over which man and animals could travel without crossing large tracts of water. Verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind. The plants are created before there is any mention of the sun. There is, however, some source of light coming from one direction which provides the 12-hour periods of day and night. While most plants can survive several days without sunlight, it was probably this temporary source of light which provided them with the daily energy they would need 
for perfect healthy growth. A possible way in which this source of light might have been generated for a while is described in Appendix 1. In this verse we have the first use of the phrase according to its kind. This refers to the inability of one kind, Hebrew, baramin, to be changed, i.e. evolve into a new kind. This was the barrier that Darwin had to break through if his theory of evolution was to have any credibility whatsoever. He never did deal with the problem. He knew that there were definite limits to the breeding of any species. He simply brushed the whole problem to one side saying it would be equally rash to assert that characters increased in their utmost limit could not, after remaining fixed for many centuries, again vary under new conditions of life. Quoted from chapter 1, Origins of the Species. This was pure speculation and as experiments have never validated this claim, the whole basis of his theory is destroyed. Linnaeus, the Swedish biologist, 1707-1778, collected numerous plants and animals from around the world in an effort to clarify, classify them so that the limits of each kind could be determined. To a certain extent, he was not completely successful. What he called a genus, or a family today, in the animal world was probably a kind, while in the plant world, a kind is probably each of the genera. What happened historically was that the evolutionist seized upon the, his classification and by arranging them in a certain order made them the basis of the branching tree of how the various species evolved over millions of years. The kinds, baramin. Regarding these kinds, there have been a few cross fertilization between sheep and goats, lions and tigers, etc., and it might be thought that these boundaries have been breached. However, the offspring are generally infertile and would have little chance of survival in normal conditions. In fertilizations generally, the genetic information is not confined to the DNA in the chromosomes only, but is spread throughout the whole of the cell structure, particularly in the cortex or outer cell membrane. Broadly speaking, the cell continues the genetic information of that of what particular kind it will be dog, tiger, horse, etc. And the DNA controls only the variety of features, size and colour, etc. that will appear in the animal. The female's ovum provides the cell genetic information, or kind, together with its own share of the DNA, whilst the sperm provides only the male's part of the DNA. Thus, the kind is transmitted through the female line the male only provides some DNA variety. While animals have fertilized across kinds, the male DNA has only changed some of the characteristics of the basic type within, within the cell of the female. The results belong to the female's kind and, to, and no viable animal has ever resulted from such a forced union. Day 4, verses 14 to 17. Then God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Surprisingly, the sun, moon and stars were not made until the fourth day, after the creation of the plants the day previously. Some contend that God created the sun and moon on the first day when he created the heavens, but that he only made the sunshine on the fourth day. This we cannot accept. Examination of the context of the words for create, or bara, and make, asa, show that there is little indifference between them. Why should God create the fish in the sea but only make the beast of the field? Barra cannot mean only to create from anything, but create from nothing, as this is used for the creator, creation of man, but clearly he was made from the dust of the earth, quoting Genesis 2, 7. And both words are used for the creation of man, verses 26 and 27. Finally, putting the whole subject beyond argument, the only correct interpretation of the Hebrew is that the sun was created in the fourth day and cannot be interpreted to mean it had been created some time before that day. The tense cannot be translated otherwise. Where possible, scripture should be interpreted consistently, and if this interpretation were to be used for the other days of creation, it would make nonsense of the whole account. Those who claim the sun was shrouded by mist or only sun or only shone forth on the fourth day are sending, reading into the text only what they want to see. The importance of this will be seen in Appendix 10. What is outstanding in this passage is the central place that the earth has in the whole of creation. The creation of the sun and moon are briefly referred to, whilst the immense power contained within the total number of stars is ignored, their creation being mentioned almost as an afterthought. Despite putting a very bold front 
On their theories, astronomers really have no satisfactory explanations for very many phenomena they have discovered. In section 2.2 we show that they can neither explain how the stars were formed nor how the planetary system came into being and much else besides. The overriding importance of the Earth in the Genesis account is surely proof that the whole purpose of God in creating the universe was to put man at the centre of a perfect environment and give him every opportunity to be a grateful and willing servant of God. All else in creation was secondary to this main aim. With this in mind, we can then see how serious was the sin of Adam that he, as our federal representative, should then proceed to throw his, this love and care back into God's face. We can see just how ungrateful his rebellion was by the fact that it brought in its train all the sin and suffering in the world. Man, with his fallen sinful mind, then proceeds to blame God for being the creator of suffering in this world. Day 5, verses 20-23 God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. The sea creatures appear to have been created in fairly large numbers of each kind, so that the local environment into which Adam was to be created would be well stocked at that time. God, however, commands the sea creatures to fill the waters in the seas and the birds to multiply on the earth. There was still a great area that they had yet to colonize. Day 6, verses 24-25 God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Land creatures were created with immense diversity, but all were later to perish in the flood except a few of each basic species that survived in the ark. Of those that emerged, many species appear to have eventually died out, for well, they do not exist today. This was probably due to their inability to survive and raise offspring in the greater different climate conditions that prevailed after the flood. What we have today is only a small selection of the huge variety of animals that God originally created. Even from those that exist today, there is still such a variety that amazes and puzzles biologists. As we look at some of these strange creatures, one cannot help feeling that God does have a sense of humour. The camel and the duck-billed platypus are but two of many animals that many have brought a smile to God's face as he created them, that may, sorry, that may have brought a smile. That God does indeed have the attribute of humour is purely proven in that he must have had it first, as a lesser form of Christian joy, before he was able to make a part of human nature. We are, after all, made in his image. Verse 26. Let us make men in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. The fraudulent nature of all the supposed missing links between man and apes has been exposed in another work. The whole theory is based upon a handful of bones, or more than often parts of bones, that are presented with a huge fanfare of publicity every time a new discovery is made. In this way the public are, at regular intervals, beguiled into thinking that they are only clever apes and not created in the image of God. God made man from the dust of the earth, i.e. the chemical elements he had already created, and he then breathed life into his nostrils. God made all the animals, but there is no mention of giving them life in this way. From this, what is being referred to here must be spiritual life, so that man may have some degree of commun communion with the body and transcendent God, sorry, with the holy and transcendent God, a communion that no animal could ever experience. Man was given all of the communicable attributes of the Godhead, such as love, fellowship with other people, sorrow, perseverance and many others that the reader might like to list at his leisure. Every single one of these gifts was tainted with sin at the time of the fall. However, it is the Christian's joy to know that he will leave a closer, he will have a closer communion with God than even Adam could have had during his earthly existence. Indeed, God being omniscient knew that the fall would take part and all the suffering that would follow what was all part of his glorious plan. Verse 29 And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree which fr whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be food. There could be no doubt that Adam and all the animals existed on a completely vegetarian diet. Such was the balance of nutrition in the pre-flood fruits that man could exist in perfect health. This changed after the flood when Noah and his descendants were allowed to eat meat and fish. Quoting Genesis 9.3 Verse 31 Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. On five, on five occasions God looked over his creation and declared it good. Now at the end of the final day of his creation he declares it to be very good. 
there was a sense of complete satisfaction with his work. It was indeed a perfect world in which he had placed Adam and given him all the advantages that he could, leaving him only one prohibition to test his obedience. Even with all these advantages, Adam nevertheless failed the test. He therefore had no excuse for his willful act. What was meant by perfect? There are certain questions that arise when trying to picture what this perfect world was like. Was there any death of animals? Did the world have a time limit? Answers must be speculated, but we will examine some topics. Death. It would appear that Adam had, no, had only a natural span of life of about a thousand years. And to allow a man to live forever, God has specifically placed the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, quoted in Genesis 2.9. When Adam fell, God banished him from the garden so that he could not have its fruit. Genesis 3, 22-23, and he subsequently lived only 930 years. The tree presumably contained some ingredient that prevented the aging of the human body. The perfection of the creation before the fall also raised the subject of the death of animals, that even insects, etc. Were they included in the ban on death in the original creation? Adam had access to the tree of life to preserve him from death, but animals had no such resource. It can therefore be assumed that they died after their allotted lifespan. That animals died is also implied in Romans 8.12, where, through Adam, sin first came into the world, but this brought about the death of man. Animals are not referred to. If animals did not die, certain problems would arise. For example, there would have been gross overpopulation. Oysters produced masses of eggs, and within eight years, if none died, there would be 10 to the power of 80 oysters, enough to, kill the o to fill the oceans. If there was no death of animals, then even insects in the path of a passing animal would have to be preserved. This is, no this is not impossible for God to order, but the situation becomes increasingly difficult to sustain. Food. Man and animals were both vegetarian after creation, quoting Genesis 1, 29-30, and this appears to have continued after the fall to the time of the flood. That this is a natural and therefore probably original state is implied in Isaiah 11:7. Having just listed a number of predators that will peacefully lie down with their prey, he then prophesies that the lion shall eat straw like the ox, Thus the picture of final perfection involves the reversion of, of carnivores to the vegetarian diet they possessed when they were first created. It seems that man may have retained his dom dominion over the animal kingdom after the fall, as there is no record of animals becoming a danger to man or even to other animals. This only becomes an important feature of life after the flood when God allowed man to eat meat, from in Genesis 9, 3-4. That some animals also became carnivores only after the flood is in indicated when God placed upon them a fear of man, quote in Genesis 9 2, so that man had some protection from them now diet, now that they hunted other animals. 3. Population, entropy, and a limit on time. God commanded Adam and Eve to multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. There was obviously a limit, albeit very extensive, on this process. There was, therefore, probably a time limit upon this whole situation, perfect though it was. This limit would also supply, also apply to the animal population. This time limit is also apparent in the many activities that would be taking place. Entropy is only a scientific word used to describe the running down of the universe. This is also known as the second law of thermodynamics, i.e. there is an irreversible decrease in the amount of energy available to do work. When all heat transfers from hot areas to cold areas has been completed, all temperatures will then be uniform and there will be no way that useful energy can, can be obtained. When a sun is cooled, all life on earth will cease. All these limits are very lengthy, and there would be ample time for God to see whether Adam and Eve truly loved him and obeyed him implicitly. Once that was well established, the end could come to any time, as we are all too well aware, Adam failed. However, God was not caught out and did not have to devise a second best plan. He knew what would happen from the very beginning, for he had already written in the Lamb's Book of Life the names of these, of those who to be saved from a sinful world. We are chosen then before the foundation of the world, quoting Ephesians 1 4. Half a phenomena? There is one theological problem that arises from this view that God's original creation was perfect. Does this mean that there was nothing with any harmful potential in existence anywhere in the universe? Several examples of danger that may have existed at the time of creation could be given. The reader might like to make his own list, but we will consider just two such items radioactivity and meteorites. A. Cosmic rays and radioactivity. Today, we have cosmic radiation coming in from outer space which is very harmful to all life. We receive considerable but not complete 
protection from them due to both the layer of ozone high in the atmosphere which absorbs them and the Earth's magnetic field which deflects them. At the time of creation, were these rays in existence but completely prevented from reaching Earth by say the water vapor canopy? Similarly, were there dangerous radioactive elements in the, in the rocks? As God declared the world perfect, we would contend that they only became active and dangerous after the fall. If this is assumed, then there is no problem in accepting the normal understanding of God's proclamation, that the world was subjected to bondage to decay at the fall would include the elements that are now radioactive, because it only to alter one or more physical properties of the forces in the atoms to allow the heavier ones to begin to decay by normal processes. We examine this fur event further when discussing polonium halos in section 4. Meteorites these are large rocks circling around the planetary system, one of which could strike the Earth at any time with catastrophic consequences. Did they exist in the day of creation? We would suggest that they did not. The astronomer, Van Flandern, has proposed that the missing planet sometimes named Phaeton exploded and created the belt of asteroids that circle around the planet's original position. However, their total mass is only a fifth of that of the Moon. He proposed that the rest of the planet formed the many meteorites and even comets that now circle in space. It is therefore possible that this explosion took place at the time of the fall, allowing the pre-fall period to be perfect. However, the trajectories of these objects should be examined to see if they could have been achieved within the time frame of 6,000 years since creation. We would also mention the possibility that this was only from the time of the fall that the speed of light began to decrease. The sequence may then have been creation to fall, man had access to the tree of life to live forever. Animals died a natural death, man and animals vegetarian. Fall to flood, man had a natural lifespan, around 900 years. Cultivates ground for food, radioactivity began at the fall, possible start to the decrease in the speed of light. After the flood, man's lifespan gradually decreased, man allowed to eat meat, animals now are carnivorous, but given the fear of man. Chapter 2, 1, 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. There is a natural period of rest on the seventh day that man needs in order to continue with his work for the remainder of the week. But there have been attempts to change the frequency of this rest day. The battle cry of the French Revolution was the deceptive propaganda slogan of liberty, fraternity and equality. Yet, once power had been seized by the subversive forces behind this clandestinely organized uprising, one of the first acts they brought in was to enslave the innocent citizens they now controlled. Far from giving them the liberty they had promised, they changed the laws to give one day off in ten instead of every seventh day, a 45% increase in the day's works before a day of rest. However, the law had to be rescinded. It was found that the workers became too exhausted if they worked more than six days without a break. A similar situation has been found in the building industry, where weekend working has been found to be ultimately less productive due to the fatigue of the workers in the second week. Whatever man thinks that he knows better than the ways obtained by God in his, in his goodness, one can be sure that problems will inevitably follow. This is quite complex, isn't it? I'm, I'm thinking of doing a... Uh, possibly, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a two-parter on this, actually. So I'll stop it at that point. It's a lot... For, for you guys out there to digest. I hope you found it intriguing, interesting, thought provoking, maybe give you the desire to seek more. So I was motivated to um, share this when I had a, an atheist stroke evolutionist telling me how he fully trusted scientists. Scientists are the only honest people on the earth, yeah? But the thing is, you know, there's true science and there's false science. And the trouble is we have information with, withheld from us. We have a, a, a satanic agenda in the world to teach mankind a, I use the word loosely, truth. And uh, it's up to us to seek the Lord and seek the truth from Him. Because He is the source of all truth. And as He cannot lie, that's why we can trust in him rather than trusting in man which Jesus warned us not to do so as he said not to lean on our own understanding 
and not to become righteous in our own eyes. Anyway, I pray you're all having a, it's, a, it's evening now here, um, or morning wherever you are. And may the Lord bless you and keep you safe from the wicked one. And uh, this is to be continued, so it's bye for now.